I'm going to define the debate today as something a little different than you might expect. I, I think that uh, when you look at oncologic outcomes, there's no doubt in my mind that a radical operation is going to have a better oncologic outcome than a non-radical, uh, you know, some kind of focal or less radical operation. Um, and so I'm going to concede that to Dr. Davis right up front. And I haven't told him about this yet, but he's going to make this argument of how about better oncologically it is. And I'm going to say, you, you're right. But that's not the only thing we have to consider when we start treating patients with prostate cancer. Um, the, the, the trifecta includes not only the oncologic control, but continence and erectile function. And we're learning some things about these alternative strategies that uh, I think it needs to be important for the future as, a, as we select the patients and the, and the appropriate therapy for them. So let's see in our debate what we can define. Um, I, I can't win the argument with him about oncologic control. And I would say that's true of any radical operation we do for cancer. Remember, we used to only do radical nephrectomies, or those of you who are old enough to remember the days. In fact, it was taught that that was the only proper operation for renal cell carcinoma. And now we do something much less than that. We do partial nephrectomies. Same thing with radical mastectomies. That was taught to be the only way to manage breast cancer. Now we do lumpectomies and radiation and chemotherapy and and hormonal therapy. So is the, the same potentially true for prostate cancer? Is there something other than a radical operation that can control the cancer without having so many side effects? So these are the options for treatment of uh, local treatment of patients with uh, uh, organ confined prostate cancer. We can, we can do a radical open prostatectomy, a, a robotic assisted. We can do radiotherapy. We can do cryotherapy. We can do HIFU. Uh, the high-intensity focused ultrasound. And if you look at the outcomes and compare the open technique to the robotic technique, Mike Davis did a great job of showing that they're fairly equivalent operations, but we've moved towards robotic surgery because we feel it's, it's, it's less um, uh, problematic for the patient in terms of recovery. And we have seen a number of parameters that are a little bit better. And in that case, I, I found 15 published meta-analysis looking at this, over 50 published comparison studies, most of them retrospective, very few prospective studies. But the bottom line from all of this is that about 25% or more of these patients will have biochemical recurrence. 30-plus percent of these patients will have some post-prostatectomy incontinence, and, and at least 10% of those, it's relatively severe, and at least 5% of those patients will have some other ancillary procedure to control their incontinence, whether it be a, a sling or an artificial urinary sphincter, and 40-plus percent of patients will have erectile dysfunction, sometimes even much higher than that. This is, sorry, a little bit of an eye chart, but this is talking about oncologic control of you know, open uh, versus robotic-assisted. And, and, uh, and the oncologic control is, is relatively uh, similar. And then in terms of operative time and blood loss, it's a little bit better in favoring robotic assisted uh, versus open. It's also a little bit better in terms of uh, transfusion rate, hospital stay. Overall complications are about the same. And it's a little bit better in terms of the three-month continence rate and three-month potency rate, but overall at 12 months, they're about the same. So we haven't really gained huge amounts of improvement using the robot for the trifecta. And this is, again, some other published series. I'm just going to throw some examples. Uh, if you're looking at the incontinence rate, uh, we do better in younger men, as you would expect. Uh, but in older men over age 60 and especially over age 70, we're not really meeting the kind of targets we'd like. We have a significant rate of uh, post-prostatectomy incontinence, uh, over 20%, and in some cases even higher uh, as the men are, are, are advanced in age. Um, and then when we look at ED, uh, ED uh, making comparisons between the different techniques, uh, no matter who does it and whose hands it is and how much expertise you have, the ED rates are still relatively high after this operation. And what can we do better to make our results um, minimize the number of complications from our operation? Well, there are a number of individuals who could be considered candidates for primary, either cryotherapy or, or HIFU. And those that don't want a radical prostatectomy, those that have minimal disease, those that have um, an aversion to radiotherapy. 
And I'm, I'm not going to go into these details about how to do the, the, the various types of uh, uh, focal therapies. Uh, I think that most of you are familiar with this. You know, the, the bottom line is that uh, in terms of complications associated with these techniques, these techniques have improved over the years, uh, just like any other surgical technique. You get better the more you do it. And a series like f like this one with Annika, he had a very high rate of, of efficacy and, and very low rates of, of incontinence and uh, erectile dysfunction. It's not as good in some of the other series, but obviously the more you do, the better you get at the operation. And uh, in terms of high-intensity focus ultrasound, this is a relatively new technique compared to all the rest that we've been discussing. There's two different device manufacturers, uh, EDEP and Sonicare. Um, the idea is to uh, focus the energy so you produce local heating, which is opposite of cryotherapy is to, to have focal uh, cooling. But either way, you destroy the tissue, ablate the tissue as a result of the energy application. And it's to offer something else uh, besides a radical surgery for men that have prostate cancer. And the, uh, the imaging crystal is contained within the, uh, the therapeutic crystal for this particular probe. I'm going to speak mostly about the Sonoblade because I don't have as much experience with the EDAP machine. Uh, and it's gotten relatively sophisticated with the, with the technology and the software that allows you to control delivery of the energy and to monitor the tissue as you treat to make sure that you've properly ablated it. And this is where the improvements in, in the technique have, have really gone up dramatically in the past few years. And you can use this technique to treat the entire gland, to treat half the gland, or to treat a focal area depending on what your uh, objectives are, and you can use some of these other techniques we've talked about today, such as um, uh, multi-parametric MRI, to know exactly where your disease is located and ensure that you have the primary lesion treated plus a zone around it, and and you can tailor the therapy based on the patient's needs and the patient's desires to minimize complications. And it's just showing kind of the workflow to do the fusion between the ultrasound and the uh, and the MRI to, in order to direct the therapy. And so this is a very tailorable approach. You can see how you can decide what you want to treat, either the whole gland or uh, the lesion and, and the zone around it. And the, this particular technology is evolving and improving as software and other hardware uh, improvements are made over time. And you can see here a, a gradation of results uh, as the, the devices have improved and the software packages improved such, such that uh, we're seeing better oncologic outcomes and better uh, rates of side effects. Uh, urethral stricture was a problem early on with this technology, but that's almost been eliminated by the more modern techniques and the more modern uh, software packages. And then the rates of uh, urinary continence and erectile dysfunction with this type of technique have gradually improved. You can see this uh, again over time with the different the devices, kind of the curve spreading out, and you see um, results that are really comparable to uh, radical prostatectomy in terms of biochemical disease-free survival when whole gland techniques have been employed in select patients. And then uh, you can look, this slide here shows uh, that you have uh, um, uh, a number of patients that can be treated with only a single HIFU session, where there's other patients that require a second and sometimes even a third session to achieve a, a negative biopsy result. Now here's a, uh, a paper um, that was looking at whole gland results and had 87% biochemical free five-year survival. Uh, here's another uh, series of focal therapy uh, looking at 625 cases out of the UK, um, and, and they tailored their therapy depending on the size and, and number of lesions that were found. Uh, but here, looking at uh, some of the important parameters, 98% you know, continence rate in this group in terms of being pad-free and being completely, utterly free of any leakage whatsoever, 80% of those patients, and 86% in terms of preserved erectile function. So this is a significant improvement in terms of of uh, side effects with this type of approach, even though the oncologic outcomes aren't quite as good as what you would see with a radical technique. However, uh, this is uh, uh, Kaplan Meyer curve showing metastasis free survival at 95% in this population and salvage free survival, not having to have a second or third 
uh, uh, high food treatment at 95% at three years and 91% at five years. Then, of course, uh, this type of approach can also be used uh, uh, for patients that have had radiation therapy that have local failure, don't have metastatic disease. You can use either cryotherapy or, or high food to treat those patients.